As their name denotes, Rock's first real supergroup, Cream, were truly a British original. By the time of Cream's formation in 1966, Eric Clapton had already gained considerable fame with the Yardbirds and John Mayles Blues Breakers, his peerless virtuosity reluctantly earning him the unlikely moniker, God. Drummer Ginger Baker and bassist Jack Bruce also made a considerable name for themselves, performing under the tutelage of the well-respected governor of the British blues revival, Alexis Corner, and later providing the rhythm section for the Graham Bond organization. Originally intending to feature straight blues, Cream ended up showing off their prestigious talents through extended improvisations. From their debut gig at the Windsor Blues Festival to their final two concerts in December of 1968 at London's Royal Albert Hall, Cream astonished audiences with their ability to take simple blues riffs and morph them into awe-inspiring jams with marathon solos. Unfortunately, such sonic heights were never really captured on their various studio albums. The songwriting collaborations between Jack Bruce and lyricist Pete Brown saw Cream veer off in the direction of heavy psychedelic blues. Songs such as Strange Brew, Sunshine of Your Love, and Tales of Brave Ulysses off Disraeli Gears fused the soulful rhythm of traditional blues with the warm fuzz and drone of the psychedelic era, all nicely complemented by the trippy, surreal album artwork and the band's flamboyant clothing. Eric Clapton even dared to sport a rather fetching afro a la Jimi Hendrix at one point. Cream's success on the pop charts now solidly equaled their prestige on stage. This stunning schizophrenia paid off on their highly successful third album, Wheels of Fire, a double record set containing both studio and live recordings. Cream's brilliance for live improvisation are unmistakable on their stunning tribute to Robert Johnson's Crossroads and Ginger Baker's dazzling drum epic, Toad. By 1968, however, Cream achieved monumental success playing to sold-out audiences all over the world. The group themselves, however, felt that they had reached the end of their artistic tether. Personal tensions that had always permeated the band now became unbearable and the group disbanded, releasing one final studio effort, Goodbye Cream. Although their tenure was admittedly brief, Cream's legacy is mammoth. Their uncompromising heavy blues inspiring such supergroups as Led Zeppelin, Rush, and heavy metal legend Black Sabbath, as such, they will long be remembered. Cream composer, lead vocalist, and bassist Jack Bruce literally never gives interviews. A couple of years ago, however, I sat down with the now reclusive artist in the American bar at the Savoy Hotel in London, and he opened his heart about his amazing days with Cream and his volatile relationships with Eric Clapton and Ginger Baker. Overtly emotional at times, Bruce, the creative backbone of the band, has trouble accepting the world's accolades for Clapton when it was in fact Jack who really drove the group. Okay, First you. time you laid eyes on Mr. Clapton. Is his name Clap? C L A P P. I believe so. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's his real name. Right. If we all have a real name. Um, yes, his. I think his, he, he lived with his grandparents for most of his life. How he gets his name Clap, I don't know. Right. Uh, from his mother or from his grandparents, right. I don't know. Right. It's not for me to Did say. He, he was an only child, wasn't he? I believe so. All right. Okay. So when did you first lay eyes on the guy? Um, first time I played with him was with Ginger. In fact, we did a. Uh, there was a kind of jam session with. Uh, the it was me. How did they manage to do that? Just a little whack. A little over. kind of oh. gesture, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, uh, he, uh, Eric was with the Yardbirds, um, and it was a jam session at the end of this festival. Uh, you were there with Ginger? Yeah, we yeah. were playing with the Graham Bond okay. band, and uh, there was a jam session, or a yam session even. What's a yam session? I suppose it's a, a German jam session. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. sorry, you've been finished. You finished, have you? I have. Okay, and uh, <laughs> so that's uh, my what was your impression of him? Oh, very good. I mean, Eric is a, is a one-off. Eric definitely yeah. is a one-off. I think his, uh, his best days have gone. Uh, 
uh, I remember him as being great uh, in the olden days. Mm. But uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean you can't you can't put Eric down. Mm. You can, but he wouldn't be right to do that. As a musician, I mean. Right, right. And uh, then next qu obvious question is, how did it come to pass? That, uh, oh well, I'm sure I'm sure Ginger will, will have told you how the band actually happened. So you right. don't need me to reiterate. Well, that. the idea is that you might have a different angle on it, unless you um, particularly want, you know, from your point of view, is the whole. Okay. Point. Uh, well, Ginger Ginger had uh, fired me from a band called the Graham Bond Band. That I heard. Uh, at the point of a knife, in fact. Did he tell you that? Um, I can't remember. Okay. I know he said it was pretty sort of unsavory. Well, uh, Ginger had taken over the uh, the running of this band, um, and uh, I refused to be fired because I, I was one of the, the inceptors of this band. Didn't feel he had the right... Yeah, well, he didn't have the right. It wasn't his band. Right. And uh, so... I kept turning up for the gigs. <laughs> I was only a kid. I didn't want to be fired. I wanted to play <laughs> with that band. Uh, Were you so still living at home and stuff like that? No, no, no. I had to leave home. Uh, I mean, unlike Eric and Ginger, I, I came from Scotland, which is uh, a few hundred miles away. Obviously, of course. Excuse me. So I had to, I had to move. Uh, and find places to live and so on. Right. Um, but I didn't want to be fired from that band. I didn't think it was right. So I kept turning up until Ginger uh, came up with a knife and said, you turn up for the next gig. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I did say that. He did? Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. And that was the end of you and Graham Bond? It was, yes. Okay. It was. Probably thought it wasn't worth it to have to deal with this guy. Huh? Well, I didn't want to get stabbed. <laughs> Did you think he was capable of stabbing people? Ginger, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we had we had uh, some pretty I, good fights. I've heard on about stage. the musical, yes, on stage. There was one where the audience sang "She Loves You," wasn't it? Where they, well, you were having a fist fight or something. Uh, it sounds like a gingerism, but uh, right. right. Okay. Now, then. Isn't it interesting that with such bad blood, apparent bad blood, cream came along? I mean, why on earth would you gentlemen because, choose to uh, work with each other? Because Eric uh, said, if you want to have a band, you have to have Jack <coughs> in the band. So he had to come along. He had just got a um, Rover 2000, which was a pretty hip car at the time. That's money from the Yardbirds, probably, eh? Yeah, he, he wrote a B-side of a, of a Georgie Fame record, I think. Uh, so he got that money. And he had to come along and sort of ask me to join this band. Or, or to try out for this band. Um, yeah, and where where did this take place and what happened? Well, we went to um, Ginger's house in Neesden and uh, set up in his little front room with his little G-plan fr furniture. And uh, it sounded very good from from the, the first point. No lyrics at this point? No, just playing, just, just playing. Did you make the decision there and then, hey, this would be good, mm. so let's keep it together? Absolutely, yeah. And then what, what was the first sort of, I mean, you had no management, you had no money, right, basically? Had no backing, had no deal? So well, what you do? Uh, Ginger was really the band leader from the start. Was yes. it his band? Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. You oh no, I, I think I think. Oh, why? Because there seems to be a lot of emotionalism amongst the three people. I I would um, accept that it was totally Ginger's band. Uh, it was his idea because he asked Eric. Eric had a, a, a very big reputation mm -hmm. uh, around, around London at that time. Right. And uh, no, it was very much Ginger's band as far as I was concerned. I was al always a sideman at that time anyway. I was uh, a kid. Mm. And uh, Are you younger than Ginger? Yes. Younger I than Eric? Way. No, Eric, Eric's a year younger than I am. Okay. 
Eric had a knowledge of the blues, but I had something else which took the band somewhere else. We had a hell of a vocal uh, yeah. approach. But I, I wrote the songs. Too, so I, I realize that. And uh, I think that's the important thing. That's what made the band different from a lot of other bands. We didn't just do cover versions of blues, a la Yardbirds, with their exceptions. Uh, I, you know, I had many conversations with Eric about how the blues, I loved the blues, but I wanted to, uh, I wanted to make my own statement uh, to carry the thing further forward. But Ginger was very much the, uh, the backbone of the thing, very much the rhythmical backbone. He told me that he used to, in the early days, so sort out all the business bits, and he was actually at that point very organized about writing things down. Oh yeah, no, he, he, was, he was the band leader, that's what I, when I say the band leader, you that's mean, what I mean. He was the, uh, what very much so was into the, uh, the business side of things. Uh, he, that carried over from the Graham Bond organization, mm -hmm. where he was the the uh, he was the one who looked after the books, if you like, and it was Ginger's idea. Oh, here she is. Wobble away. Um, where were we? We were well. I don't know where we were, but I, I'd like to about him carrying over the books and being the band leader. Very That's true. In very interesting to hear you say that. I mean, I don't think people generally know that. Let's put it that. No, I think I think Ginger has not, never had the uh, uh, recognition that he should have had about that band. Uh, that, that was his band, and and uh, we brought our talents to it. But it was his idea. Uh, Do you think Eric Clapton would acknowledge that? Yes, I think so. I think so. Okay. Um, I think the cream is probably best remembered. When I think of cream, I think of the lyrics. And I think of, I mean, I'm not trying to stroke you at all. I'm, I'm just saying, I think, you know, I think of a lot of things, but I think of the lyrics and I think well, about... Well, the lyrics, then you have to talk to Pete, Pete Brown. Well, I have talked to Pete Brown. Yeah. And, but I also think of your vocal thing. So tell me how your collaboration with Pete Brown came about. I know you were early on, but in terms of cream, let's move it up to just where cream... Well, those great um, songs got written. Mm. Well, I mean, he's got a he's got a great story about sunshine. Uh, she's on this documentary, which I, I had forgotten. But but when he told told the story, I remembered it. Um, and I, we had been writing at night, and it was like five, six in the morning. And I said uh, well, nothing was happening, so I just picked up my double bass and went ba 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 bum bum bum. They looked out the window; the sun was coming up, and he said, "Oh, it's getting near dawn." <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know um, that kind of thing. Fairly organic. When it, when it says uh, Jack Bruce, Pete Brown, did you actually write any lyrics or just the music? We work together on the lyrics. The music is all mine. But, uh, Can you give me an example, say, in, in Sunshine, is there any lyrics you wrote? You um, there was as the Beatles this, you know, what line did you write, sort of thing? Well, you see, as this, the person who had to sing it, if, if Pete would come up with lines that were unsingable. Right. So I would then uh, say, well, no, it should be this or that. I can't, in that particular I song, I can't remember. Is there any that you can one? remember? <laughs> um, well, lots and lots, I guess. Say white, uh, anything in White Room? I, th I think that started off about bicycles. Really? What do you mean? Or uh, um, right, oh, fridges to Eskimos. I can't remember quite what. Oh, you mean instead of saying White Room, you said... No, I mean, I always uh, worked with Pete on, on the lyrics. With, with exceptions, I can't... White Room... Uh, Sunshine. I couldn't give you examples, but lots of them. Right. Um, uh, lots of the the ones, the other songs. I mean, it, we work together on the lyrics, right. and, and you know, we still have up until the last record. What did Cream do? Do did Cream get a following in London, and then it just kind of slowly, or at what rate did it accelerate? Is that how it happened? Not really. Clubs in London. No, uh, we didn't have a lot of success in London. Um, 
It was America that, that uh, made the band. How do you get to America, though, if you haven't made it where you are? Well, we went uh, on a, a thing called the Murray Decay Show, which was... Uh, oh, God, it was The Who, it was us, it was um, The Miracles, it was, you know, you name it, it was on it. That was our first, uh, our first trip to the, to the States. And then we I simply did, this, uh, I think, a seven-month tour of one-nighters oh. all over the States. I think probably the longest tour uh, after B.B. King or somebody. Uh, well, that was a rough tour. I, I, I've yeah, that finished the band. I mean, it made the band, but at the same time, it finished the band. What, living in such close proximity yeah. to each other? Yeah, exactly. Well, look, I mean, it's pretty obvious now uh, to me that um, there was... And you know, maybe the strong feelings amongst you guys, the love, and I won't go as far as hate, but just strong feelings, sometimes wonderful, I suppose. Yeah, no so hate. No hate. hate. But what was it then? What was the negative bits? Because there's a tension. Tension? Is that right? More than tension? Too strong? I would say that, that, um, that Eric always wanted to be a star. And uh, when, when he played on the White, on the Beatles' White record, when he got involved with George, that uh, that he thought he should leave us behind. Ginger told me that Jimi Hendrix once sat in the band and he was the only person that ever did. Yeah, I could tell you the exact story about that if you like. Um, we were playing uh, St. Martin's School of Art and I was in a pub opposite the art school having my pre-gig pint and uh, this person came up to me and said oh hello I'm Jimi Hendrix I'd like to sit in with the band and I said uh, well people don't usually do Have that. ever heard of him? No never. I said well people don't usually do that uh, but you know you're welcome uh, but you'll have to ask the other guys which he did then he sat in and he blew us away. He blew us all away. Ginger said he didn't like it because he was didn't like all the showmen. And I loved it. I loved it. I mean, apart from all of that. Because you guys, in a way, you sort of got into it a bit, but the other 12, Eric just kind of always stood there in a way. We all just stood there. Uh, if you're playing in a three-piece uh, in the way that we did, I mean, Jimi Hendrix wasn't the three piece. It was Jimi Hendrix with a couple of guys. <laughs> you know, could have been anybody. Yeah, that's true. You know, no disrespect to Noel or Mitch, uh, both good friends of mine. But um, that was, he, Jimmy, I always thought was was like a a, a carry on from from the Delta, the Delta blues, sort of psychedelic Robert Johnson. Yeah, if you like, yeah. And uh, you know, I loved him. But uh, he certainly blew us away that night. You know, whether it was through playing the guitar with his teeth or, or what. And did he do all that? Did he? he did, yeah, he did. But he also played brilliantly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he. I mean, I've got a, a tape of of the next day. We we were um, we were rehearsing for for a, a record. And you uh, have you have tapes, the cream tapes, that no one's heard. Yeah, and. Uh, God, look at that. And they can never, oh, it's horrible. And there can't be uh, anything done with those, can they? I certainly hope not. That's a suitie. Yeah. So, so you, you have a tape? tape? You have a tape of you and Jimmy? No, 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 of, uh, yeah, I have. I've got tapes of, um, of uh, the rehearsal the next day after that gig where Eric is trying to play like Jimmy. Really? Yeah, and uh, failing miserably. In this rare interview, Liz Baker, Ginger's first wife, looks back on the formation of the world's very first supergroup. Ginger was working with Graham Bond. It was one of the jazz festivals. I think it was um, probably... Uh, the NJF Jazz Festival, I think it might have been down at Reading. And Eric was with the Yardbirds. And um, Ginger said then, he said, I want to work with Eric Clapton one day. And um, came a time when he was working with Graham Bond and he'd really just had enough. 
You know, and Ginger just said, well, he wanted to form a band and um, he wanted to ask Eric. So um, he said, do you fancy um, going to see Eric? And Eric was working in Oxford with John Mayle. So we drove down to Oxford. And um, Eric was actually playing, but I think he was probably a bit bored because he was like lying down on the stage playing, you know? <laughs> That'd be a good symptom. <laughs> and um, we just went to, see, went to see Eric afterwards and went, you know, backstage. And then I think we went down to the local pub and said to Eric, you know, Ginger said to Eric, how about, you know, I'd like to form bands and I'd love you to be in it. And Eric just said yes. And, then he said, what about a bass player? So Ginger sort of rumbled a bit and um, Eric said, well, you know, what about Jack Bruce? And Ginger went, um, uh, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Finally, virtuoso drummer Ginger Baker sits down to set the record straight about the convoluted history of Cream. I've walked out from the gig and there's Rod and what have you, and we're talking and smoking dope outside the backstage area outside the dressing room around the back of the theatre where the trucks are smoking a joint and this guy who's just one of the crowd around there obviously something to do with music because he's, he's backstage right he suddenly comes up to me and went I know you Baker you're not a fucking hard nut this is Eric Clapton it was cool you know because I'd got, by this time got this reputation of being a hard nut. We stood there talking. I didn't know he played guitar or what he did. We were just talking. I was... So I think it was about a week or so later, we were playing a Graham Bond gig somewhere, and Eric turned up and sat in with playing guitar for about three or four numbers. And it was really enjoyable, you know, it was really great and like. I thought, wow, that's really nice. And that's why he did this <coughs> on several occasions. He'd come down and sit in with the band. And, like, he was really playing good. And he was, like, really into the music. And that's why I went to see him. But we, then we, it was shortly after meeting him that I asked him to join the band, you see. I drove down to Oxford, where Eric was playing with John Mayle. Eric doesn't know I'm coming, right? I've decided to form a band. Move first one, Eric Clapton. Is he going to play guitar with my band? That's who I want. Drive down to Oxford. Eric's on stage, sitting down on a chair, playing real sort of lethargic like this. The crowd's all sitting down, people standing, walking around, nothing much happening. I walk in just about as time for the interval. Here the last number and it's the interval and I go in backstage and Eric sees me and goes, hey man, come and have a play. So I says, yeah, I'd love to. And Huey Flint was a drummer, he said, man, that's cool, you know. Um, so John Mayles, obviously, he, who'd been around with Alexis, I'd played with John several times in jams and he said, yeah, man, come and have a play. So like, we went back on stage and it took off. Eric and I immediately were like, it was bang, and what, here we go. Like, we, it was a jam of incredibility, right? The whole, the place took off and it was happening. So after the gig, backstage again in the dressing room, uh, I said to Eric, listen, Eric, I'm forming a band. Are you up for it, you know? And he said, yeah, man, <laughs> cool, I'm there. <laughs> and so I said, okay. Now, a bass player, and he said, Jack. Now, I just fired Jack six months before, right? And we'd parted on somewhat unfriendly terms. However, I thought, yeah, he's certainly the best bass player around. <laughs> Eric was living in a room with one bed in the corner, a couple of boxes, and a couple of chairs and a, a gas ring, you know, a couple of gas rings on a little stove type thing in one corner. Um, it was a record player and stereo speakers, yeah. He was playing um, Beach Boys music. 
This is in June in London. It's a really lovely summer day. And I went round there and woke Eric up and she came in and he said, uh, do you want some something to eat? So I said, yeah, man, I'm starving. So Eric proceeded to cook French toast, which I'd never experienced before. <laughs> my, really, it was my first, the first time I ever ate French toast was cooked by Eric. And he cooked this stuff, and that was, that was when we went, that's when we went off then from his flat, I believe it was from his flat down to Portobello Road, because it was just down the road from me, to buy all this extraordinary, we went on several shopping sprees. After the first one, Jack came along and joined in the fun. We felt that we were different to everybody, and, and therefore we would dress differently. Jack was the obvious musical choice. I had little alarm bells go off when he said it, but I thought, oh man, you know, is, I'd known Jack for a long time, we've been friends for a long time, before the falling out. So I said, I'll tell you what, Eric, I'll go around and see him. The first thing we did was all get together in Neesden and play. At the back was a factory and the Welsh Harp, and like the kids used to play out there at the back, and we started playing. I think it was, a, I can't remember when it was, it was like in the afternoon, we are playing there, and all these kids came from all around. There was about 20 or 30 little kids, little ragamuffins, and they were all boogieing up on the hill while we were playing, and it was really magic. I mean, it was just, it just was, it just clicked musically so tight immediately that it was just like three people all knowing where the other one was going, and we were like playing arrangements, which we continued to do really throughout, certainly the first year and a half of the band. It was like musical creation every time we played. We were creating, you know? We didn't like, we, everybody knew just where to go by what was being played. It was, it was something totally magical. It was the same thing as the first gig with Alexis Corner, but even more so. You know, it was, it was just musically so good. This is when we sat and we just said, this is the best thing in the world. And I think Eric said, yeah, the cream, man. And we went, yeah, that's it, we're the cream. He was just a, a young guitar player who I'd met, I liked him personally, and I really liked his guitar playing. I didn't know, like, it was only, like, on the first sort of few Cream gigs, all of a sudden it's clapped and it's God written up on the wall. That then I, and, and that explained why all of a sudden, instead of 800, we'd got 1,200 people, you know? There was, Eric was, had got his own following as, I'd got the following via the Graham Bomb Band, but Eric had got his own following that had come from the Yardbirds because he was something special. And obviously a lot of other people had realised this, but I, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of this right at the very outset of the band. So I'm faced with this band all of a sudden. That there, there are parts of it which I'm not really happy about. Um, and yet it's doing better than anything I've ever done before. <laughs> it's doing exactly like, I mean, you know, within Robert Masters was, I kept going in there saying, listen man, this guy, instead of 100 gig for the universities, ask him 200, man, and we were getting it. So they would ask him 400, he'd go, no, you can't do that. Nobody pays that money. I said, ask him. And he'd ask him and he'd go, yeah, sure, that's cool. <laughs> you see? And so all of a sudden, like, I could, we were beginning to earn like, we did one little tour for 45 quid a gig, then we were fucking 75 quid a gig, then we were like, within three months, we are getting two or 300 quid a gig. We, we ended up, we were doing so much work, it was ridiculous. Put it this way, the band was in big demand. It hit, it, just because of who was in it. We did this gig for Bob Potter in Camberley or uh, somewhere out west, outside of London, west, this guy Bob Potter ran this club. I knew him of old. And we did the set, 
we, which we contracted for an hour set. And in fact, we did probably more than an hour. We did one set and Bob Potter come up to me and said, hey man, do another set. So I said, Bob, you give us another 45 quid, we'll do another set for you. He went, oh no man, look, all the people are here. I said, Bob, you're getting us for 45 quid and you want us to do another set? I said, give us 45 quid or we, and we'll do it. He went, oh, come on, Ginge, look, man, look, the people are all going mad, man, you've got to do another set. I said, man, if you're not going to pay us, we're not doing it. And I got in my car and drove away. Apparently, Jack and Eric did another set on their own. And Jack convinced Eric at that moment that I was definitely not the drummer for the band. So for that evening, they were, I was out of the band. Eric then changed his mind <laughs> and said that perhaps he didn't, you know, it wasn't a good idea that I should, and I stayed in the band. However, they called a meeting and virtually sort of said that it's a cooperative band and we've got as much say in it as you have, to me. On the one hand, the situation with Jack was getting going much as I dreaded it would before I even asked him to join the band. However, the band was flying. It was so successful and nobody was more aware of how successful it was becoming than I was because I was the one who was doing all the, the office work. I was, I was constant, in constant contact with Robert Masters every day and with Stigwood, and we were planning the future. We did fresh cream in like 10 days. The thing we had on stage, we could translate to the studio very easily. We, all, we were all really professional in the studio. We'd all turn up on time. Um, we'd get the track done, at least one track done in a day. On most of the tracks, Eric, because we were in the studio, Eric played rhythm guitar while we did the track. And then he'd put the guitar solo on afterwards. So the only thing that was overdubbed on Fresh Cream, I doubt there was very much overdubbing on at all. It was just magic. It was like an underground thing as just everybody, you know, everywhere was buying the records. You couldn't get enough of them, you know. They were like selling out when they, as soon as they came out. Um, and so Stigwood, of course, is uh, enjoying this rather. <laughs> He's the, the manager of the, the newest happening thing. Um, and one day at the office I'm greeted with the news that he's joined forces with Brian Epstein and now the Nems and Stigwood was one whole huge me megalithic fucking management thing, the Beatles and the Cream. What year? This is, when did he die? The same year he died, 1967? Yeah. This is 1967, this is the same like we've got the f not wheels of fire, the other Disraeli gears. This is the result of the Disraeli gears going straight to number one, right? <coughs> now, the Astoria, is it the Astoria? It was Brian's theatre? No, the Saville. The Saville. On Shaftesbury Avenue. Yeah, it's got an S and an A in it, not bad. Okay, so shortly after their merger, um, we have a gig organised in the Seville. Now, all of a sudden, Cream is the big thing. It's in all the headlines, in the Melody Maker, the New Musical Express, and the general press, you know. There's keep little Cream snippets appearing in all the newspapers, you know, little stories about Ginger the Happy Hippie and little things, you know, like it, it, was, it was the happening thing. 
so we're going to do this show at Brian's Theatre and for this we've got an enormous spectacle uh, arranged you see um, we're starting to get into theatricals um, I think it's one of the only gigs we did with cream where dry ice was used <coughs> um, there was behind the stage instead of being two stacks of marshals there was marshals stacks ran from one side of the stage stopped at the drums and then went from the drums across to the other side of the stage and the stage at the Savile Theatre is pretty fucking big so there's about six stacks of marshals either side of the drums the finale was to be this extraordinary thing where Eric would play the last chord feed it back into the speakers and then walk away and leave the guitar suspended from wires on the ceiling in front of the speakers feeding back. Another guitar would then fall, be lowered down on wires and he'd grab this guitar and play another chord and feed this back into the next stack, right? Jack had meanwhile done the same with the bass. So at the end of the show, the stage would have been there was dry ice coming up, these huge phalanx of Marshall speakers, each with a guitar hanging in front of it, feeding back. And that was... The, we, we. How long would that go on? Just this feedback going How long on. would the feedback go on? Quite a little while? A long, long time. It was the end of the gig. While all the feedback's going on, all the crowd's going wild, and we're back in the dressing room having a drink, you know? Yeah. What were your impressions of Brian Epstein as a person? I was very impressed with him. I mean, again, we knew, like, within our circle that Brian was a pufta, okay? I mean, it was something some people were. He was, again, in the same way as Robert Sigger. He wasn't an offensive person. He was fun to be with. He was, you know, just one of the crowd. He, he had a great sense of humour, and he was just an ordinary person to be with. He, was a, he didn't flaunt in any way that he was homosexual or put it on people, you know? It was, wasn't sort of going around trying to chat everybody up. Well, that didn't happen at all, you know? Uh, he was just a nice guy. And, like, I was really impressed when I saw what happened with Jagger for trying to complain about this stupid article the, the best thing to do was ignore it it's certainly the far, be far better thing to do in that situation most of the time people like that are so low they're not worth bothering to even everybody knows the whole just about 900% of the British Isles knows that the, the news of the world is, is, is fun to read but don't believe it. You know, it's like the National Enquirer. It's got is the same thing. I mean, it's something to laugh at. All they do is cause people who know the facts. They cause it amusement. So why get angry about it? You know. Um, that Brian wasn't around for with us for very long. We heard of his death. In fact, when we were on the airport. I think we were going back to the States to recall Wheels of Fire. Or it was some, or to go on the tour. I think it was to go on the 1967 States tour. We were actually at London Airport when we heard of how he died. And it would seem the way he died was one of those accidents where he took downers and alcohol. And he didn't apparently, as far as I know, take that many of either. But he got, he actually just got the, the lethal concoction of alcohol and barbiturates dead right. And it doesn't matter to, in quantities, it's the quantities relative to the quantities, if you understand. Like three to two would be the lethal mixture, which is in fact what, he, what he'd done totally without intention, I'm sure. It was a, one of those accidents. One of your colleagues, however, had a different opinion about the death of Brian Epstein, didn't he, Mr. Bruce? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's ludicrous. Well, for, for what purpose, what good would it serve Robert Stigwood to knock a brilliant mind, which Brian was, I mean, business-wise and for, for handling that sort of situation, 
I think it was probably rather unfortunate for the Beatles too that it happened because look at the mess they got into after that. But but that's not the point. The point is that was Jack's opinion. That's what's interesting. Well, it wasn't his opinion right then. I think it's, it's an opinion he's arrived at later in life on just... He, he's his wild and angry fellow, is Jack, wild and angry at Stigwood, who he considers ripped him off <coughs> to an enormous extent. Uh, me, I'm not sure to what extent. I, I don't think it was quite as enormous. It certainly wasn't as enormous as Jack considered. All right. Can I ask you another question? Yeah. All right. When did the... Is this the right time to ask you about meeting various members of the Beatles? Is this around the right time? No, because I, I, I didn't meet meet any of the Beatles very much at all. The The first time I met any of the Beatles, I think, was when Eric got married at the famous party where Jojo made a total fucking idiot of herself in front of everybody and still doesn't know. So just she, right yeah. there, yeah. <laughs> oh, Jojo. Now she knows. Now you know. Uh, so I mean, that was that okay. was the first time I met any of the Beatles. Oh, really? So. That was in 1980. Yeah. Oh, I see. You never met them during that period. No. Oh, okay. Well, you, you see, this is where you people get this strange opinion that because we're all famous, high-flying pop stars, right? That we all hang out together. What you don't seem to realise is that when we're high-flying, very successful pop stars, that we're all working. We are all touring. We are all in the studio making records. Now, when you're touring, you're going from this town to that town, and they're on tour when you're not on tour, and you're not on tour when they're on tour, and you don't really meet people that very often. But yet, George Harrison and Eric Clapton wrote Badge. Yeah, well, now this is right. At the, this is the end of Cream. This is when Cream's already dead. It's still going because we had contractual things to fulfil. The band is dead. The band is dead. Right at that point, Cream died six months before it finally died. Virtually six months. Maybe it was three. It certainly. It was like it didn't sort of. It's. It, it was in the middle of a tour. Right. It was well, in the middle of the last tour that we decided to finish the the band. All right, I don't want to jump there yet, but I I want to I want to inform you. You told half of the Linda McCartney story. You didn't tell the whole thing. You just said that she followed you around and took pictures. Oh yeah. You didn't tell the bit about the stewardess and the okay, jealousy. Right. Well then yeah. Then what happened? <laughs> oh God. Jojo, jo, I'm sorry you were there. <laughs> Is she really there? She's right there. Oh, Jojo. Jo. <laughs> that's all I know. She says she had a ball. I know, but we were all going, oh, God. Bring my Yoko Ono. Yeah, right. Um, anyway, yeah, Linda story, okay. You just told Wheels of Fire, right? We, we, we're just getting towards finishing the album of our two weeks in the studio. And that morning in the Gorham Hotel, the telephone rings. And I pick up the telephone, and who is it but Senior, the air hostess. And I'm delighted and surprised that she's called, right? I've like really fancied her, really, and gave her the phone number while happily having f on the flight over in first class drinking and I thought nothing more of it. And here is this beautiful lady on the telephone saying, I've got, a f I've got four days off and we're just about to go. In fact, I think she's got six days off and we're just about to leave on the tour. So she came over to the hotel and came to my room and we fell to enjoying each other's wonderfulness. <laughs> and so then I'm off, we go into the studio to finish up the album. We've got about a little bit of one track to do, which is virtually finished. So of course, Senior's with me when I walk into the studio and she's looking like a million dollars. <clears throat> instead of the cowboy boots and jeans and rugged 
outdoor look of Linda, here is this woman in high heels, black stockings, tight short skirt and a really smart suit and jewellery all over her and looking like a million dollars. And I proudly walk into the studio with this wonderful looking creature. She was she was tasty with senior on my arm <laughs> to receive a very stony look from Linda because I think it was the day before Linda had been around following me everywhere and I'd been chatting to her quite a bit and I remember Linda had this way of sitting on a chair with her legs wide apart and <laughs> sitting talking to you and she was quite a good looking chick <laughs> and I sat there talking with her and asked her I think we were smoking a joint and asked her would she like to come on the road with us where Linda had replied in the affirmative so the next day I've turned up at the studio with senior on my arm I didn't speak to Linda because it was rather embarrassing to talk to her really and I was very proud of the, the woman on my arm um, and I, that the, the next time I saw Linda was in fact in Africa. It was the next time I saw her. Fine. Uh, is it time to talk about Hendrix? Have we passed when you first met him? Well, I, have I told you about the time he first came? You haven't mentioned him okay, once. We're doing a gig now. This is a, I think this was at the Victoria Palace or, or one of the big gigs in, in, in London. And Jimmy has met Jack and Eric without me being around. So I've arrived at the gig and Jack's come up to me and gone, hey man, Jimmy Hendrix is here. He wants to, he's, he wants to sit in with us, <laughs> you see. And I've gone, who the fuck's Jimmy Hendrix, man? He went, J Jack said, he's this great guitar player, this great American guitar player. I said, yeah, but man, we've got a guitar player. You know, Eric's a guitar player. What do we want the guitar player for? Nobody would ever sat in with us before. And for that matter, nobody ever sat in with us again afterwards. I mean, it wasn't something, you know, we'd got our own thing. What did we want another guitar player sitting with us for? And he, he went, yeah, but Chas Chandler's brought him down. Right? He's a friend of Chas Chandler. Chas Chandler's his manager. I knew Chas, right? I said, yeah, man, but... Really, no man, it's our band. You know, like, what the fuck? We don't want somebody sitting in with our band. Well, I took some convincing. And I said that, you know, like, sure, he can sit in, he can come and sit in with us, but, like, I mean, Eric's not going to go off and leave him with the band, like, he's got, they like, both got to play. So, anyway, Jimmy appeared on the stage and started to play. And he was playing quite good and I was quite enjoying it. Then he started his um, on-stage showmanship. Bullshit, you see. Now, to me, our music was enough. We didn't have to get into all sorts of gyrations and pretend, to, pretend to fuck the guitar <laughs> and play it with your teeth and do all these extraordinary things which he was doing, which to me, I'm just going, well, man, you know, you lost me at this point. You've lost me. You know, you're into the same sort of thing as the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. Um, for me, Cream's music was so good that we didn't need to do any stage shows, any acting, you know, apart from the occasional great thing like we've done at the the, the, the Saville Theatre, <coughs> just uh, like, uh, something to finish the show off with. But we didn't need to do all this thing, and it, it really left me totally cold. In fact, I had an enormous row with Jack at uh, this particular time about about Jimi Hendrix sitting in. Um, and he, he sat in, and he was a big fan of the band. I mean, he, he formed his band in exactly the same format as Cream, and in fact he stopped in, in the middle of a television show one time and said oh enough of all that crap let's play something good and started playing sunshine <coughs> um, and dedicated it to us he was a, an enormous fan now i think we've had somebody say that like eric was totally blown away you see jimmy jimmy's a fucking great guitar player there's absolutely no doubt about that um but 
I don't think he was a better guitar player than Eric at that particular moment in time. Eric was playing streets above him, to my opinion, at that particular time. Eric was, to me, a better player. Um, Jimmy was a great showman, a great showman, but that's what put me off him at this particular time. We later became very close friends shortly before he died. Um, Didn't you go to dinner the night after the show or something? That what the night he sat in with you, didn't you have dinner with him or something that night? You said you went round to his house or he went, came round to you or something? No, this was later. Oh, okay. This was me. later. Uh, my my opinion at the time was, yeah, man, but that's, that's called great showmanship and all that. That sort of rock and roll, that's not what we're about. Right. Uh, and later I was to meet him. It was after Cream and after Blind Faith, in fact. Oh, I see. Spalding Festival was a, another time when I came across Jimmy. Um, it was this huge festival in Spalding, which is the in Lincolnshire, it's a heavy farming area, gardening and flowers and agriculture area, and they had this huge festival, flower festival. Um, and on the bill were Cream and Jimi Hendrix and we were all in this house which was had become our communal dressing rooms and we all had parts of this house as our dressing rooms. This huge house. Um, now there was some extraordinary goings on in the Hendrix dressing room department and Mitch Mitchell had a Polaroid camera and was taking Polaroids of Jimmy with chicks and then rushing around to show them to everybody, you see. Naked and chicks? Screwing them, yes. Oh. Jimmy actually performing his... Um, legendary. Stud-like legendary act, too, of, of which he was amazingly adept. And during the Spalding Festival, I think I saw Polaroids of Jimmy a top of and in various uh, sexual positions with at least seven different chicks <laughs> during this festival. Um, and here is like, now I'm a very straight sort of person and I'm longing for this sort of thing that Jimmy's getting really, you know, with two or three chicks at the same time and this was, had been my wonderful dream that had fallen apart with Liz and Jill, um, you know, uh, and I was still, uh, in a way I envied Jimmy, you know, his ability to pull all these chicks and uh, the, you know, Mitch and everything and, and Noel Redding running around. Now, that was a, another meeting with Jimmy where, you know, we were on the same gig and we, we blew a couple of joints together and J well, when he was free from the ladies, which wasn't very much. So, I mean, Jimmy, you didn't see a lot of during that time. Most of his time was in the dressing room with a willing queue of ladies <laughs> ready to uh, experience Jimmy. Um, now, there's another... I'll tell all the Jimi Hendrix stories in one go for you. Sorry. Okay. Now, later, we were in Chicago on one of the tours. Uh, this is when we were very big, and we are staying in this huge hotel in Chicago. What it was called and where it is, I have no idea, Jeffrey, but it's a huge hotel, lots of wood, and very grand hotel. And we're in the reception area where we are approached by two young ladies. One of them um, can only be described as a dog. The other one is quite a good looking young chick. They have with them a briefcase and they approach us. I know who this is. Yeah, right. They, they approach us, you see, they come up to us and they say they've got a proposition for us. So I say, oh yeah, what's that? So we sit down and they open this briefcase. And in the briefcase, they've got two uh, plaster casts of penises, you see. 
one of whom is this erect penis plaster cast like this, labelled Jimi Hendrix. And this, um, you see, I, and I've looked at Jimmy's and thought, well, fuck me, he's hung almost, like it looked like a replica almost of my own thing. It was really, you know, about the same size and everything. And I thought, well, he's not fucking got anything extraordinary, large or uh, phenomenal, you know, like as what you would imagine with all the, the chicks he's growing. However, the other one was the most amusing one of their, their um, samples of their work they were showing us was this funny, twisted little thing, <laughs> which was Noel Redding, <laughs> who had obviously, you see, they explained to us the, um, the procedure. And the procedure was this, that the good-looking one would give you head, you see. And while she was giving you head, when, when you reached a, a, a state of severe erection, the other one would then slap this cold, wet plaster around your erect Member. penis <laughs> and, and thus get an impression of it. And their idea was they were going to market star dildos, you see. It was quite a brilliant idea, really, I suppose. But Noel had obviously not been totally turned on. And when this dog had slapped the cold thing on and squeezed like this, well, it had shrunk. And the, the actual thing they got was sort of this half-erected, twisted little thing that was really tiny. <laughs> It was an old reading, but they'd got it because this was the only two plastic cars they'd actually managed to get at this time. They certainly didn't get ours because we, the three of us, voted in unison and without even having to look at each other that this was certainly not um, to be with us, right? And as I told you before, we were all three of us uh, from the same sort of upbringing, which is, you know, the lower classes thank God, are far more decent than the, the upper classes when it comes to things like uh, sex and what have you. They're much more um, normal, you know? Restrained. Restrained and normal, and, and also it, uh, any sort of sex involving uh, either of the other, any of the other members of the band or any uh, members of the same sex didn't appeal to us, you know? Jeffrey Giuliano is the author of some 30 internationally best-selling books on the Beatles, John Lennon, and other iconic musicians of the 1960s. In 2006, his book, Paint It Black, The Murder of Brian Jones, was made into a film by Stephen Woolley and Nick Powell entitled Stoned, The Wild and Wicked World of Brian Jones. It remains a cult classic and the only film bio of the Rolling Stones. Giuliano is also a veteran journalist, having written for dozens of high-profile newspapers and magazines, including The Sunday People, The Daily Mail, The News of the World, The Mail on Sunday, Playgirl, and Rolling Stone. A noted film actor, Giuliano starred in such movies as Vikingdom, Scorpion King 3, Jules Verne's The Mysterious Island, The Fifth Execution, Far Cry 3, Fire, Fire Desire, among many. In addition, he hosted the long-running North American syndicated radio series, Jeffrey Giuliano's Roots of Rock, for five years, as well as pioneering the audiobook industry in the 1990s by authoring, narrating, and producing over 250 original, non-book-based, interview-driven productions. Giuliano's publishers included Random House, HarperCollins, Delta Entertainment, Dirk and Hayes, Playaway Audio, Speechworks, and B&B &B Audio, among dozens more internationally. In 1998, Random House acquired his firm Tribute Audio, for which Giuliano acted as CEO and publisher for five years. His best-selling audiobook, That Fateful Night, True Stories of Titanic Survivors in Their Own Words, was nominated for a Grammy. In 2014, Jeffrey Giuliano founded Icon Editions and G2 Media Arts to market his updated works as well as publish new projects. 
As a visual artist, Jeffrey has been showing in galleries across America since 1977, garnering impressive reviews. His first professional assignment was designing several T-shirts for The Who's Pete Townsend in 1976. Jeffrey also designed and illustrated many of his original rock biographies for the biggest publishers in the world from 1984 to 2006, as well as designing for his pioneering record label, Samba Records, in the mid-1990s. From 2006 to 2011, Jeffrey was also the primary designer for the French fashion house Cotai. When Giuliano first conceived of creating his own literary imprint, Icon Editions, he became responsible for illustrating and designing 35 book covers, several hundred CDs, DVDs, as well as dozens of promotional posters, and eventually, an entire collection of exclusive fashion and art. The expansive design by Giuliano Brand grew out of Jeffrey's impressive commitment to the arts and is the culmination of a lifetime's work by an extraordinarily talented and determined Renaissance man.